much, Michael. I, I trust you can all hear us, and if you can't, do let us know. Uh, I have a list of questions prepared, but actually, um, given the conversation that we've just been having in the, in the dressing room, in the green room, I thought that we might start by talking about the importance to you of working within a community of the community of, of singers and community of musicians and composers that, that you've worked with, how you feel that's worked over your career, what it means for you. And, uh, a very simple uh, um, sentence I say is that um, music is about harmony. So if you play music with people that you don't have harmony with, that you don't live with in harmony, it, it will be audible, I believe. And over the years now, I've a little bit like I have this habit of working with the same ensembles up to the effect that promoters say, please come with another orchestra. <laughs> uh, we've heard you with that group so often, and I say, but they're my favorite orchestra, and they're old friends. And when you walk out in a rehearsal, it's you have this beautiful um, element of music making that is not just the addition of talents. But it's like the, this kind of infamous X factor. There's this, this um, multiplicator. It's like a catalyzer. And the, the sum of all uh, skills is not just added up, but it, it multiplies with an unknown factor. And this, for me personally, happens especially if I work with people I know really well. Yes, of course. So when I... Um, entering a rehearsal room for a, to, to work with an ensemble for the first time is for me almost as frightening as singing a new program in concert for the first time in front of an audience. I enter the rehearsal room, I meet people I've never met before. I don't know how they react to me. I don't know, can I say something? Can I correct? How much input can I give? Is there a conductor? Is there an instrumental leader who kind of t is in charge of everything? Will I insult him if I stop in the middle of the piece and say, look, I have this idea? So, so there's so many subtleties in communication that I'm always very careful. And we need, I need to kind of raise all my antennas and try to read read the, the group and the dynamics inside the group quickly to know how I can, can work. And, and there are times when I just, I start to say something and I realize that nobody actually is really interested in what I have to say. <laughs> and then I think, well, I'm a guest here. There's somebody else in charge for the music. I know my piece, I know what I want to do, so I, I just play along. And there are ensembles that challenge me and say, no, 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 tell me. Tell us how you feel. So there's this dynamics. And um, the, the happiest moment in song recitals for me are when I'm on stage with my lute accompanist, Edin Karamazov. It's a 25-year-old friendship now. And I always say when we travel, it's like an old couple traveling because we know each other so well. We check into hotels together. We have dinners and breakfasts together and sit in planes together. So. I think I could sing with my back towards him and his back facing mine, and we would still be able to communicate musically. It, 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 it borders on telepathy. Of course, I, I, I think it's like reading the little noises of someone's breath, reading the body language, the body tension. When do I get ready to sing? And then me hearing what he's doing. And, and this is a, a um, highly complex activity, the kind of duo. Playing, I don't see him as an accompanist, but I see him as a duo partner. And again, I need to really know him to to get to this kind of intimacy of music making, and I need to like him. So that's uh, that's salutary. So, so then, I in terms of the way you work with people, it's it's very important to have that relationship and and to. Uh, to be able to build a relationship perhaps over time. 
How does that work? How does that translate to the English environment where everyone prides themselves on their sight reading and they come in and they play the music and they, and they go again and they're very efficient? I mean, I, I think, am I right that you learned to read music when you were 12 or something like that? No? No? Is that wrong? When I learned reading music when I was 20, as a scholar at all. I, when I applied for the school in Basel, actually, it's 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 um, they accept uh, bachelor students, and they always did like so. You work there for to get a diploma. Um, normally, I would not have been accepted because they have, of course, an entrance exams with with music theory, uh, ear training, uh, melody dic dictat. I don't know how you know, dictation. You have to play a little piece on the harpsichord. It's it's. Not super difficult, but I came from a boys' choir tradition where uh, we memorized everything, and and I have to say, uh, it to me or to the audience, it doesn't matter to know whether or uh, once you hear a piece and you like it, does it make a difference whether the artist learned it for three weeks or three days? <laughs> it's it's uh, ultimately that's up to me. So I'm actually very happy with the memorizing skills, which is really important for song recitals. And I had then to, I was accepted because of my singing, and the director wrote, we, we, we like to remember your singing performance, we less like to remember your musical theory performance, <laughs> so I remind you that w uh, this first year will be hard work for you, and it's a thing called four course, pre-classes, that it's a luxury in Basel. They they can accept people who have an, a special talent and lack the theory and knowledge. And then you get this extra intensive, I had five hours of ear training a week, I had basso continuo basic class, I had singing lessons. And then after a year, and cembalo, and after a year, then I, I uh, passed the regular entrance exams and I was officially accepted into the school. So I, the sight reading was is not not still not my strong point within a certain style. Of course, if I sing a Bach aria, a Handel aria, a Dowland song, or something, I know what to expect. So then sight reading is easier. But I'm 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 still a pretty bad sight reader. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, fair enough. Uh, maybe we'll come back to that later. Actually, uh, on the subject of your of your training, I think uh, you wanted to say something about your teacher who recently died and uh, was a very important figure, I think. Uh, I, can, you, can you talk a little bit about his influence and perhaps the influence of uh, sort of other, other major musical figures at the time that you were learning? Uh, I started my studies in Basel in 1987 and I didn't know my teacher Richard Levitt beforehand. Accidentally, a lady who lives in our village said, oh, I heard your teacher, because I told her, will be Richard Levitt, look, I have an LP here with uh, a recording by Thomas Binkley's Studio for Early Music, and it is Oswald von Wolkenstein, and look here, it says Richard Levitt, so I had an LP of my singing, future singing teacher. And uh, I started singing with Richard when I was 19, I just turned 20 then, and I don't know, it was the, the perfect match. He's, he's a, he was a fantastic teacher. He was a slightly mm, exotic personality, I would say. It, c it could be quite difficult with other people, but he loved his students, and the day before he died, he was lying in his bedroom, and we were all three of his students and his partner were sitting there and we were talking and we knew it would be the end soon and we would hear him once in a while almost he had uh, already uh, um, volume injections of, uh, yeah, to, to ease the pain and, uh, and then once in a while you would hear him no, 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 no stand upright, yes <laughs> come back again next week <laughs> and, then, and then he was out again and, but, but this was until on his deathbed, he was a teacher. He had the fantastic ability to condense complex, sub complex procedures in singing into simple sentences. He said things like, 
maximum sound with minimum effort. He said, don't forget the animal in you. <laughs> Very important, what after, after working in detail on a Dowland song and shaping things and it was all, we tried to get it really right and clean and neat. He said, yeah, but don't forget the animal in you. Now, now, now we are right, but we want to have this low energy out of your body. We want to hear the, the pain of the singer, of the, of the poem, actually. Another thing he said, singing is easy, being a singer is difficult. <laughs> and uh, and all I remember all these things and he, in, in a way it was like, he was a very big man, so he had this a body that was like a demonstration doll for singing technique. So if I were to, sh well, I'm a little bit overweight too, but not as as Richard was. So when he when he said, "Put your hand here," and then and now see what I, what happens when I breathe, and then when I do this, there's a little movement. But with him, there was like, whoop. <laughs> it was so so it was it was it was so clear. The the it was a very physical approach, and it was uh, an eye opener. And I felt so safe with him that I, um, I never second-guessed him. The, in, the, in the Schola Cantorum, still up until today, there's a rule that as a student, you're not allowed to perform outside of the school without the permission of the director and of your singing teacher. And the idea behind it is very clear. If, if as a teacher, you train a student and you are on a, on a path to replace a bad element in singing, a bad habit. At, uh, I, I, for example, in the beginning I was like, oh, I was twisted my head and Richard said, no, stand in front of a mirror. And it, was, it took him like three years. At times I still do it today, but he took away most of it. Then, within the protected uh, surrounding of the music academy, you will always have your teacher checking on you. Under stress in a concert, we rely on our on what we know best, and that's the old habits. So to build a new habit is like here is my my construction of technique that I have that includes a few mistakes, and here the teacher starts to to build something new. So of course, if I'm under stress in a concert, I always lean on what I know best. So it's the Sisyphus work of making the new idea, the new technique, the new way of singing as strong and much, much stronger than the old one that under stress you rely on the new thing, on the, on the thing that is better. And so we were not allowed to sing outside of the school. Not many students followed that rule. Everybody just went out. And I always went to my teachers at Richard. Somebody called and asked me to do the Matthew Passion. <laughs> he said, are you crazy? You just, just, it's your third year. After your diploma, we can think about working on the Matthew Passion. If somebody calls for a St. John's Passion, yes, we work the arias. It's just two arias. This is feasible for you. And uh, I, I never thought that, oh, my teacher keeps me from breaking through or holds me back. I always, I I always played it safe. I always thought, hmm. Learning the whole areas of Matthew Passion is also lots of work. It's not just difficult, it takes lots of time. <laughs> so learning two areas is easier than learning five or five plus two duets. And um, so I always trusted him and he constantly encouraged me, said, go and study with other teachers. And I said, but why should I? I don't know. So the only other teachers I worked with were teachers that came to Basel. And there was uh, Emma Kirkby, Evelyn Tapp, Tony Rooley, it was Nigel Rogers and René Jacobs. So they were like visiting teachers, and these are other teachers. And they never co their work never collided with Richard Levitt's work. They, Richard focused mainly on the development of the voice. And these teachers gave impulses from other directions into singing. And that was a perfect combination. Can I just ask you about one of his axioms? Singing is easy, being a singer is difficult. Can you <coughs> unpack that a little bit, what you think he meant and what it means for you now? Mm. 
It relates with another saying that he said, which was like, in pop music, no, in classical music, you are the messenger. In pop music, you are the message. <laughs> and he always encouraged his students to sing popular music, folk music, Broadway songs, pop songs, pop ballads. And the idea behind it is, in the classic music world and in the early music world, there are safety procedures. If I go out and place myself in front of an audience, if I am truly myself, I really open myself up in front of an audience, I feel vulnerable. So to be safe, I can do as if. So if I'm a baritone and I'm about to sing a Winterreise, and I'm uncertain about how I mean it, how far can I go, I place my hand on the grand piano and I do as Fischer Dieskau did. It's fantastic. He had such a huge success, so why, if I just do 90% of Fischer Dieskau or 75% Fischer Dieskau, I can just go on YouTube, I can see all the greatest singers and I can pick their ideas. I take a bit Fischer Dieskau, a bit Thomas Hampson, and in the end I'm a little pinch of my own flavor, and, um, and this is what, what happens. So I can play, take somebody else's personality to be safe, because that interpretation proved that it works. It's, it's just, it has been successful, it is even satisfying to an audience. I go and hear my 15th Winterreise, and I say, yeah, this is how I know it, this beauti beautiful voice. That's all I can say then, that's beautiful voice. And, but that's it. But let's think Sting doesn't have a good day. He cannot say, I'm not feeling well today. I think I do a little bit like Elton John. <laughs> Why? Because people come, they want to hear Sting. They come for the person. They come for his personality, what he stands for. He has no way of hiding. And all classical singers that joke about pop singers should take a microphone and stand in front of a hall with a guitar and a band and sing a Elton John ballad and see how that goes or sing one of their own songs. It's easy. I understand what, what the, where the kind of depreciation of pop music comes from. I understand that from the use of the voice and all that. But there is an intimacy in great pop performers that is essential. So this is about being a singer. It's um, the process of singing is easy. I can work on technique and all this. But what Richard always said is we need to be unique. Imagine you're a, a young Baroque soprano starting your career today. Conductors can choose from so many excellent sopranos, they all have good techniques, they have beautiful voices. So why pick one specific singer? Because she is unique. She has something that she offers that the others don't have. And in my teaching, this is what, and this is what Richard always wanted, he, didn't ne he never wanted to be students in imitation of himself. A great friend of mine, Kathleen Denine, an Irish soprano who did a lot of folk music. She started the very same day and she was so afraid that this big man, as she said, would turn her into a wobbly opera soprano and she would not be able to sing folk music. And in the first lesson she said, Mr. Levitt, I'm a folk singer and I don't want to be a wobbly opera soprano. And, he's, and, and, and in this inimitable way he said, honey, don't worry. I will make you sing folk music even better. And this is because he he'd never thought about taking away a specialty, a uniqueness in a voice and a specialty in a personality to f fulfill a cliche opera cliche or song recital cliche. And that's what he meant with being a singer, to really go out there even on a day that you're not in great shape, which happens, it's statistics. René Fleming says, there are seven days a year when I'm in great shape, and unfortunately, I don't have concerts then. <laughs> <coughs> so so, so this, this is a little bit, you, 
you go out and the, the, the night before something happened, you had a fight or this or that, or you didn't sleep or you f just start to catch a running nose on the voices clock. You still have to sing. You work very hard. You sense that it's not what you hear yourself. You stand next to yourself. You hear what you do and you say, oh, I know how it could sound, but it's not sounding how I think it should sound. And this is the, the biggest tragedy happening to a singer when you separate yourself from yourself you need to be in the moment and you need to be one and not separated so you start separating yourself while singing you think about stuff that's not right and then three days later there's a review posted i don't know announcing the end of your career or something <laughs> seriously this 10 years ago somebody in the financial times announced the end of my career yeah he's 40 years old now and we know that countertenors have a limited shelf life, and uh, now time seems to have caught up with Andreas. Oh, you see, I can quote all the bad reviews, <laughs> and I don't remember the good ones. So this, this just shows the, the thing that tortures us at times. This is being a singer at times is really, really difficult. And if you're in great shape and, if, and everything's fine, it's just easy peasy. But unfortunately, that there are these fights, and. Richard Levitt told me when I complained about this after I signed with Decca and everything went extremely well and it and then a while later my father died and I I was not in a I had a really bad phase and, and, and I went to Richard and I said, Oh, I'm looking for the effortlessness. I want it to be effortless. And he said, What do you think? You 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 graduate from music school and you sail from success till success until you retire. Is you, you don't you know what life of a singer is? And that's what he meant. Being a singer is difficult, singing is easy. And so I'm guessing this now you you've succeeded Richard Levitt, <coughs> correct? Uh, at, at Basel. And and so you pass these sorts of lessons on to your, your own students. How do you uh, how do you get the best out of a new student? How do you do what he did with you uh, all those years ago? I have to say that I'm much nicer and much more friendly and positive <laughs> than Richard Levitt is. Richard Levitt could be quite rude, and not everybody could take it. For example, my sister, Elizabeth, after came to Basel after I was there for already three years. She said, I want to study with Richard Levitt. She saw the progress I made and she thought, hey, I want to study with that teacher too. And she couldn't stand him. She quit, she changed teacher, and which hurt him a lot. And it, But the two of them, it, it just didn't work. So succeeding Richard means that I teach master classes in Basel. I had a, my own class where I led students from entrance exams to the diploma, but that was took too much time in a way. And I to do it to do that seriously, I would have to give up me singing many more concerts, do doing many less concerts than I did at the time. And uh, I had even offers in, in other universities, yeah, yeah, we will find an assistant. And, uh, but, but, and, but I think as a teacher, you really need to be there every week. And it's just an hour and a half singing of singing lessons. So if then there's an assistant, then, then you better don't teach there. Um, so I teach mainly master classes in Basel, in Mainz at the university and all around the world when invitations come. And I told you before that it's the, the exciting thing about a master class is that it's a little bit like, I've never tried it, but I imagine it to be a little bit like speed dating. <laughs> because there's like clock and there's music playing, somebody sings, and you have like three minutes as long as the aria lasts you have to try and receive as much information from that person in front of you as you can. <laughs> it's, and, it, and it's complex. It's, it's not just the voice, it's the personality. There are students who are incredibly timid and they're frightened <laughs> by singing there. So they need an encouragement. Then there are the, 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 the singers I call the cafeteria kings, like the, 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 the stars of a high school that show a little bit off and you, you, you need to sense all these elements. You need to quickly see where are the technical difficulties and which of these technical diffi difficulties can I approach in a master class and which 
part of a problem I'd better not touch because there's no time. It's it's a masterclass is mainly working on musical interpretation on on acting in front of an audience. It cannot solve technical problems. So there's a uh, the, the brain kind of works in 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 overclo overclocked mode, and I need to then when the music stops and the singer stops singing, I need to start saying something and the first sentence is very important and in, in, in and this is something i copied in a way from emma kirkby who taught in basel and i remember her teaching a soprano back then uh, a young girl who actually never made a career i don't know if she's still singing at all but i never heard her sing better than that day with emma kirkby because when she stopped singing and she was frightened the voice was shaking emma said Yes, that was already very good. And now let's start to work. And through this confidence that she gave the student, the, the, the encouragement, something started and the development. And in the end, it was a really moving performance. It, I don't know how you would compare it with other singers, but for what we witnessed in that moment, it was the best singing that this soprano had ever done. So there's so much psychology about how you talk to somebody and my main idea of a masterclass is not that people come to get my judgment or my opinion. The idea of a masterclass is that in the end of the masterclass, the students that leave have better new or new ideas, created sounds they haven't created before. It's a, like a laboratory. The, the singing lesson is a laboratory. It's not about getting it right but it's about putting a new potion into this liquid and poof, there's some smoke coming off and then you say maybe no that is a bad smell we don't <laughs> <laughs> we thought this might work but it does not let's try something else this is a singing lesson it's it's about expanding the the existing voice into areas where it has not been and frequently when i encourage tiny thin Baroque sopranos to imagine they're a huge big opera singer <laughs> and to woo -hoo -hoo, create these big sounds. They they try it a little bit and I say, no, no, come on. Man. And I always do it for them. I dance in front of my students. I have I lost all inhibitions. And I tell them and I tell them that they need to do this because if they don't experiment in the singing lesson, where is the place to experiment with your voice? This is the the lab where you try out things. And then they go for it. And usually it sounds ridiculous, like, whoa, really big. But they stop and they say, oh, because they're surprised. And, and the answer is usually, and I, I didn't think I could produce such a big sound. I say, look, yeah, we have learned something. We, we, we touched the frame. It's like a picture frame. And, and we want to paint on it with a brush. And we reach the frame, oh, and we stop. But we want to have a larger canvas. We want to expand our colors, our, our, the size of our canvas. So we need to push through the frame. And when it returns, it never returns to where it was before. But there's the knowledge, oh, on that day, I could do that. So it is contained in me. It's not something that we look for miraculously to happen, but it already happened. So this is when the idea of being a singer is establishing a frame around yourself, it's, it's constraining, and you help them to think outside of that frame. I wonder, given what you said about the importance for you of working with people you know, of having relationships, long-established relationships, whether the speed dating experience of the masterclass, sometimes whether you regret it, whether you would like to work with students over a longer longer period that's the frustrating part of of the of the master class experience is that <laughs> you last summer i taught a master class at the bach academy in, in stuttgart and there was an, an alto an, uh, a contralto lady and she worked very hard and and within the lessons we got to a point where she really made progress where i thought yeah it's getting into s uh, she did es ist vollbracht 
And it was something. And then she sang it in concert and she fell back completely to what she did before. And it was painful to, to, n to not say, come back next week, we need to uh, go back, revisit this moment, see what we can, how we can get back to the better version or to the more intensive version. That's the, that's the uh, difficulty with the uh, uh, masterclass teaching and uh, officially I'm not teaching privately and I, it, it's, it's a rule, but once in a while I meet singers in a masterclass that I like so much and I say, hey, call me, come over, and then I just I just teach them, and I I don't charge them anything. It's just for fun. It's the it's the luxury of saying, wow, I I travel all over the world and at least all over Europe. I meet interesting singers, and once in a while there's a, um, without sounding material, but like the the full package, the full. The, the the oneness I discover in a singer that there's a nice friendly personality, it's, that's uh, that's somebody who's kind and patient with his colleagues. It's things I observe and I I demand of them and I preach to them. It's somebody who reacts quickly to new ideas, who has this quick grasp of a new idea, who's not like, how do you mean it? And um, um. and on top of that, they have a good technique and they are intelligent and a beautiful voice. And this happens not often, and I say, oh, it's the, 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 the students that <laughs> keep me doing it, because sometimes it can be very frustrating also that you just, for a week, you work intensively, and, and uh, some students, they just there's no, f no feedback. But this is not the student's fault, it's the maybe my fault, or the combination. This is also something we talked about beforehand, that... Uh, it's the teacher-student combination. There is no universal teacher. There are many great teachers. But the great teacher, the, um, Jessica Cash, that made Emma Kirkby great, or that is Emma Kirkby's teacher, is not necessarily the best teacher for soprano X or for baritone. It just is not that. It's, um, there's so many factors that play into the teacher-student relationship that um, it's almost like winning the lottery if, the, if the, the, the chemistry or the frequency that you communicate on is, is adjusted equally, that you really talk in a language that the student understands and the, the feedback of the student is something that the teacher understands. And I think there's no shame within the uh, Basel Music Academy, uh, uh, the Schola Cantorum, as the teachers, we talked about this. And we said, it's not a shame if I have somebody who I think it's it drives me mad. And I, then I go to my colleague and I say, Gat, listen, take him for, <laughs> for a week and tell me what you think. And try to, and then sometimes a colleague says, oh yeah, but actually when I did that, it's, uh, I cannot assume that I am the, the teacher that has the right ideas for everybody. And there is no method in a way. It's such an, uh, th 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 there, there is some kind of science involved in singing. There's anatomy, physiology. There are basic facts and rules that apply for all singers, like uh, subglottal pressure. And there are things you can measure, frequencies, acoustics, and all this. But the essence of it, it's something that is very elusive, that is just the esoteric side of, of singing. And if there was a method, it would be like, like a pilot on the runway saying, okay, flaps, gear, check, 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 pressure, check, check, check. I accelerate, I pull, and I fly. And then as a teacher, we, we wish that, and that I say, okay, what, what did he tell me? He said, <sighs> low breathing, head relaxed, the mask, uh -huh, and this, and now, and if I do this, it has to be right. I fly, but it's it's just not working. It's we cannot we cannot anyway. I, I don't know. Neurologists would tell us that there are only as many body functions that we can control consciously at the same time. It's in the end 
it's like a tennis player who does not think anymore. Ball in the left hand, I throw it up. Now my right arm moves back and I do this. This is probably how you approach it, but in the end it's the different elements come together in one amalgam, in one thing. And you can find a language that um, gives a key word to a complex procedure. And for the student then the key word or the experience of the moment, when it comes, unlocks all the complexity again. But you cannot think about all the complex uh, complex uh, anatomical uh, motions, movements that need to happen when you when you sing. That's the. <coughs> it's the other way around. It's we, if we we can we can observe a healthy singer and see what he does. But if I imitate the symptoms of healthy singing, it does not mean that I'm a healthy singer. <laughs> it's the overthinking aspect again. Yeah. So. Um, the, the idea of language, the importance of, of using the right language is, is uh, and, and not just following this set checklist of techniques, is more important, I guess most people would say, for singers than for, for other instrumentalists because your instrument is, is inside. Um, is there anything in particular, do you think, that as a countertenor, you have to think about in terms of whether it's it's the metaphors that you use or the the way in which you want to convey to other to other young countertenors how they ought to think about their singing. Is there is there anything in particular? Th there is one element in relationship with the language that is very particular and that makes uh, speaking as a singer as a countertenor so difficult. If I'm a baritone. And um, and I think, for example, the, the beginning of, of Flow My Tears by John Dowland. And it's got, the notes say, Flow my tears. And then I c but then I can bring it into, Flow my tears. I don't know whether that's tasteful for that song is another question. But what I can do is I can... I can bring the, s the sung voice as close to the spoken voice as possible. And then I get into this Sprechgesang and, 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 and it makes it very alive because it's not a singer singing to me, but it's somebody telling me stories, somebody talking. And, and you can do this for individual words just if I, if I sing and, and hate or and hate. <laughs> yeah, I... I connect the meaning of the word hate with the word while I sing it, I bring it into a speaking context and it has much more impact than if I sing it properly. As a countertenor, my speaking voice is an octave away from my singing voice. And hate! I, I don't know how to do this. I can't do this. And this, is, this, is a, this can be a frustration because I, 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 I actually never used my baritone voice, just a few exemptions, until like about four years, five years ago. And, and now with around 50, I think, oh, maybe one day I will sing baritone. <laughs> maybe in 10 years it will be mature enough, because it always felt like some weird second creature living in the throat that does not really follow the same instructions as the head voice does. It's the same vocal cords, but I want to do things with the chest voice, without thinking, as I can do with my head voice, and it just doesn't work. So this, in, still we have to try to get as close to the spoken word. And this is what Richard Levitt always said, if you have an idea of how you would speak it, how you would recite it in a dramatic manner, like a theater actor would, then you already have an idea of how to sing it. But the distance from the speaking voice that the countertenor has makes it makes it difficult. Well, I think we should uh, now open the floor to questions. I mean, we've had a, a wonderful initial discussion, and thank you so much for, for um, leading us into issues of singing and taste and our relationship with our, um, with our teachers, which is so important. 
But uh, I'd like now to open the floor to, to questions from the audience. And answers have came in. Oh, yes, yes. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. <laughs> I was wondering, just on the last point that you made um, about this distance between the, the octave you speak and the octave of the where you're singing, um, whether you could tell us a bit more about um, the difficulties, if you have any, when you interpret uh, roles in operas that are perhaps heroes in the story, but sing at, at that sort of like octave, which uh, was perfectly fine for the 18th century, and people associated that with the romantic hero of the story, no problem. Mm -hmm. Whereas in, the, in, in nowadays context, and that's not necessarily the first thing that people think. And I was wondering whether you have, um, have any, um, anything that you want to tell us about uh, ways in which you reconcile the two, the two heroes of nowadays and the 18th century one. Or that, that, that's a very good question because it's, it's this, this contradiction that we associate heroism in, in vocal performance with a high C or with a baritone with a and, 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 and once I said like sometimes we think drama and masculinity is measured in decibel. So the, the louder you can sing, the longer you can hold your high C, the more virile you are. Or so but but this, this these are of course the conventions that we created ourselves. It's not a um, God-given or no, not a natural law to say men have to sing that way and it's more masculine to, to sing uh, tenor than it is to sing countertenor. But what, what I think is interesting is the, um, the reason, to think about the reason why did people run to the Haymarket Theatre listening to Senesino sing Giulio Cesare, one of the most heroic roles, or Riccardo Primo, Richard the Lionhearted, and these were castrated men, and they thought it's some. They give them something, and there's a, a, a beautiful um, book by Dominique Fernandez, French author, called Poporino or the Secrets of Naples, and it was written in the early 70s, long before uh, early music hype and everything, and ca countertenor castrato, long before the Farinelli film, and uh, and in that fictitious story, the young castrato Paul Porino meets the Mozart boy, Mozart at the age of 12, and while the adults are eating, the two kids talk about why do people run into the theater and why do they think it's so heroic to hear a man with a high voice. And there's a beautiful, beautiful concept by Dominique Fernandez. He says it's the desire of human beings to be complete again. And you could say that the Primary, it's, it's, it take, might take me three minutes to explain this. The, 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 if there was a UFO landing outside here and somebody walks in and says, what are you? I would not say, I'm a man. I would say, I'm a human being. I'm from planet Earth. I'm a human being. And society, wherever we are on the globe today, um, assigns certain uh, eigenschaften, attributes, and certain ways of behavior to one or the other sex. But, I don't know, um, emotionality, sensitivity, uh, mental strength, leadership, uh, they are primarily they're human things. They're not male or female. Yeah? Like in the mid Middle Ages, uh, a knight, yeah, he needed to be able to chop off heads with his sword, but he also needed to be able to write a poem and sing a song, which is not something that we think Arnold Schwarzenegger would do these days, as like the, the kind of poster for masculinity. So these, these rules change, and even on this very day they are different. And uh, the countertenor, or the, you know, I always say, I already say the countertenor, the countertenor today and the castrato back then transcends these conventions. He allows himself on the opera stage to stand f not for the travesty of male and female, but for the next higher and truly higher level for humanity. And he can be a human being and can be a figure of identification for men and women in the audience. It's this desire to not exclude elements of our personality uh, as a man, 
uh, I have to be careful. I have a very good friend. He's a policeman. Well, I don't have to be careful. I say, conventions would say, I can't tell my best buddy I love you, but we do. He sends me messages saying, Ich hab dich lieb. And first I was a little bit, but I know I mean, I really truly love this man. He's my friend, and when I see him, I hug him very long, even in public, because he's my best friend, and it doesn't hurt anybody to hug somebody you love. And my two and a half year old daughter, whenever there's music playing she likes, she starts to dance. And we find ourselves in a pub or in a place, and our favorite song plays. The impulse would be to get up and dance. It doesn't hurt anybody if I stand up and dance. But we are so concerned about what people think about ourselves. Well, what? Oh, but if I stand up and dance, they would think it's silly. And, um, or if, if I hug my friend too, m too long in public, will they think I'm gay? So we are so much concerned with this, and we constantly suppress positive impulses that we carry inside of ourselves because we are afraid of judgment. And the castrato in the opera stage, he can be heroic and he can sing with a high voice. He transcends this. He doesn't care what people think, in, in, if you could say that. So that's why it reflects the desire for, the deep desire for being complete that we all still sense in ourselves because we have these little moments every day where we need to watch ourselves to not say the wrong thing, not do the wrong thing, because it would be uh, pushed onto the other sex, so to speak. Yeah. Do you think uh, having to have that, that robustness, really, that not caring that you seem to suggest the castrato had to have, he had to have a, have a very thick skin to sing and, you know, everyone would come and, and take it and enjoy it, but he couldn't care about the insults. Do you think that that's something that uh, countertenors are beset with today? I think, yes, fortunately less today than at the times of Alfred Deller, for example. I, le, le, let's, let's imagine society in the 1950s, 1960s, and then a man singing like a woman. I still had uh, reviews in the, when I started in the early 90s where the headline was, Mann mit Frauenstimme. Man with a women, woman's voice. That was the headline of the review. So it's... And, and now think back of, the, of Alfred Deller or even James Bowman, Paul S. Wood. It's f fortunately society moved into a more tolerant way of dealing with each other and with each other's uh, individuality. As long as it doesn't interfere with my life, I can be who I want. And it is also the, the most negative reactions I had I wouldn't say aggression, but a, a drunk uh, wife of a donor in the United States after a concert who could not stop asking me whether I could have children or whether I'm, <laughs> or whether, and she thought it was funny, but it was, it was really that it was I, something, she couldn't let go of this. She needed to constantly provoke me. I, I stayed calm, but it's, it's this, um, the provocation we see in somebody doing something without caring. And it's like the punks in the 60s that had green hair and the businessman who needed to put on a gray suit every day and hated that suit. And he saw somebody who said, I like to have green hair and I color my hair green and I don't care what people think. And then the natural reaction is like, how do you dare? I need, you need to stop this. It's, it's the, the ag aggression against people who are different, it's usually because they do something we would love to do. They, they take a freedom that we don't dare to do, and therefore we hit them on the head and say, no, no, go away, because you make me realize my own oppression, my self-oppression that I put on myself. You are too courageous. I can't do this, so I'd rather not see you do it because it makes me feel too bad. So does that mean that for you, you know, that as well as the importance of teachers, there's an importance of a sort of lineage of other countertenors that you can say, look, these people have done 
and I'm part of this tradition, and it's a valid tradition and a venerable tradition. In the same way that the Castrati did, actually, they looked back to their predecessors and said, I'm singing his music, and it, it's valid. Absolutely. My first ever countertenor recording I heard was James Bowman singing, and he still is my great hero. I was a, I'm a big fan of James Bowman, and it was so much fun to then meet him, in, actually. And, and then later I discovered the voice of Alfred Deller, and I, I sat in a hotel room in Cologne with two little speakers connected to a CD player, and I was in tears of hearing him sing Whaley Whaley and The Wife of Usher as well, and then other songs. And I... I I would have loved to meet him. I think, oh, it's that would. So I sung at his festival in Stour, and with my friend Yestin Davies, we went to his tomb, and it was was really it was an emotional moment because we, and uh, I in the beginning when I started, um, saw myself and I still see myself in the tradition of English countertenors, like coming from the boys' choir tradition, and then parallel with my career, David Daniels started his career as the the number one American and fantastic and world famous countertenor. And there were it was cl clearly a difference in, in how the voice was being used. He was far more operatic, had a bigger voice. And so it was both of us felt that there is a tradition there's like the countertenors who start not necessarily in an early music context, but just developing the voice, which actually is probably more healthy than just thinking too much about early music singing, which at times equals limiting your voice. So, yes, there is a clear uh, uh, conscience or uh, knowledge of of the I don't know Alfred Deller, James Bowman, Paul Eswood, Michael Chance, then maybe my generation and then and there's already now many many younger generations and, and it's and it's shocking when you work with a young colleague in metropolitan opera christoph de says mr scholl i listen as a child i listen to your recordings <laughs> and i said what do you mean <laughs> and, uh, and then i did the math and i thought yeah it's just possible yeah and uh, <laughs> and uh, but he's a, he's a great friend he, we, we did many opera performances together yeah Yes. I'm interested in the relationship between your countertenor voice and your baritone voice. Do you use the baritone as part of your training for your countertenor voice and vice versa? And would you do that for teaching? Um, as long as you keep the two registers separated, I think it's you can work in both at the same time. Like, like uh, you can work uh, as a student on baritone repertoire and on countertenor repertoire. Uh, in Basel, we had a Latvian uh, baritone uh, who started as a countertenor, but then he found he could do both, and he said, what should I do? And it was one of my students, and I said, just, if I would ask you to sing a song now, which register would you choose? And he says, baritone. And I said, well, maybe that tells you something about where your true voice lies. The danger lies in singing repertoire that overlaps the two registered registers, where you constantly need to switch between head and chest voice, and that can be very, very tiring for the voice. It's for many countertenors, it's a very important part of their work because the head voice doesn't reach low enough to cover the entire alto register. Fortunately for me, my head voice goes low enough that it's just for dramatic purpose in an opera or uh, the famous for he's like a refiner's fire that you kind of use the chest voice as a kind of dramatic effect. But for, I would say, 95% of everything I sing, I don't need my chest voice. And I'm happy that I don't need to use it. But I worked with my teacher on the passaggio, switching between the two registers without making it too audible. And it, it, the gear change, as we call it, <coughs> is, is usually it's always audible. There are some countertenors who worked very hard to cover it up as smoothly as possible, but it's, uh, it's, it's two different registers. You talked um, just a moment ago about, uh, about maybe it not being such a great idea for a countertenor to start off in the early music repertoire. And I notice that 
in your in your own career, you you did start very much with the early music. I mean, partly because of coming through the the boys' choir tradition, um, but but now you're recordings are pretty eclectic, your performances are eclectic, and you're a composer yourself. So mm -hmm. you, do you think that you're consciously sort of trying to diversify, or, or what's, it, what's it about? Mm. I think as a, as a young singer, uh, if I, I studied at the Schola Cantorum, and at the time the countertenor voice was very much uh, linked to early music repertoire, when I auditioned for a tenor who also did sung countertenor, Herbert Klein in Germany. Uh, and uh, I went there with my father, and my father asked, so where can Andreas study? He said, well, you can either go to England, or you can go to Basel, to the Schola Cantorum, where René Jacobs teaches. England was out of the question because it was too far away, and I was a little bit out of the, off the radar from my parents, and I think they liked the idea that I was just three hours away and uh, there actually there was no no reason for this concern but uh, that's that's why they chose wh that's why they why they chose uh, basel and uh, so the sorry we have a word. <coughs> ah, yeah. and and as a young countertenor of course then within the context of the scola cantorum it makes sense to sing early music and to get a kind of standard repertoire which is what you will be most likely singing once you finish school. It's like Bach oratorios, the Handel oratorios, uh, the most famous Handel cantatas and these things. And, uh, and then you kind of develop your voice within that context. Yeah, that's the... It's very intriguing. And, and uh, I wonder whether you can answer this question. Uh, many instrumentalists playing period instruments struggle hard to find a sonority that they think is connected with the time and place of those instruments. And that's what they, they cherish in their work. And then they find that they have a, a singer who comes along and you may say, well, you know, we don't have the artifacts, we don't have anything to go on, or much to go on. But he or she in office says, well, they just come and do what they do, don't they? And do they do that, or do you do that, or do you have a sense in which you sing in response to instrumental sonority, which is historical? Of course, I, I, I don't just show up and, and do my thing. I, I always listen to my colleagues. <laughs> I certainly come from an early music education, so I, I know about the sonority, I know about the development of a phrase that aims to reach a certain point, like instrumentalists have to imagine texts or affetti in order to create a sound. It's, it's piano in Baroque music is not just piano. Piano means painful, means dolorosa, means timido, means timid or careful, a forte can mean aggressive. It's not just the vol like turning the, the, the volume knob. The, with the historic context, the, it's a very delicate subject because I, um, if I were to exaggerate, I could say we can research how the instrument sounds. We have gut strings, we have the Baroque violins, we have books about phrasing and all this and it all accumulates into a rather boring performance, but we say, yeah, it's boring, but it's authentic. And the question would be what, is, what means authentic. It, it, it collides at times, this idea of finding truth in recreating an actual sound as it was, can collide with the mission, really the mission that musicians have in the 21st century. We are playing this music for an audience that does not live, does not feel, does not think like an audience in the 18th century. We play sacred music in concert halls with air conditioning, LED lights. We arrive by electric cars that drive themselves and have mobile phones. So the, we, are, we, we, we live in a completely different world. And I think in an early music festival, of course, I love to do these things to play for a knowledgeable, skilled audience that appreciates the subtleties of, of historic music making. 
But then there is Mr. Bach speaking from heaven and he says, Orchestra, Andreas, Mr. Conductor, yes, you're playing in a concert hall. I wanted to save souls with this music. It was meant, this cantata was meant for the Pentecost Sunday where the, the population of Jerusalem welcomes Jesus as their savior, he writes in, and so, and you need to translate this from my time. You cannot just play the music historically, you need to move, you need to touch the audience, and you need to make them better people. I want to save souls, so how do we trans, this was so much at the root of Bach that I can even imagine, and I've done it many times with modern orchestras, that if they have the will to adapt, of course, they were not playing romantically with huge vibrato, but they had modern instruments. And there were times when I thought, it's impossible to have modern orchestras play baroque music well. In the beginning, I was invited at times to in the United States, modern orchestras, and it, was, it could be really, really terrible. But then I started working with modern chamber orchestras, like the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, other also American, all over Europe. And the players played Baroque violin at times. They switched instruments. They read about this music. And then just their willingness, the collective effort to give themselves to the music, to think, it, to be intelligent musicians who understand the words and who understand the mission, we managed to communicate and I think maybe it did not sound as it sounded with Bach, but Bach up in heaven would have said, yes, this is how I wanted it. I would have preferred it with Baroque instruments, but nevertheless, you succeeded in, in the mission, in, in, in my basic idea, which is to, as they said in the Baroque time, movere e docere, to move and to teach the audience. And then, so uh, Sigiswald Köken wants provocatively said, uh, for, for decades we studied the books, now it's time to close the books. Never, I would, I would support this. But he, what he meant was that there was for a while an obsession with so much details. You could have a symposium about the gut string on the, on the, in the court of Louis XIV between autumn uh, this till sp early spring then, and then you would have people. So, so we got so much into the detail that we didn't realize, how can I present Bach? I don't want to name composers, but there was, uh, uh, conductors, but there was this idea of playing Bach with individual instruments. And say, no, no, it was only one instrument and one singer. Fantastic idea. And then it was presented as, this is authentic. But it was presented in a place like this. It was the least authentic context. So uh, I think authentic and, and historic, it's... It's a, it's a very, it's a minefield. <laughs> I guess that Edward's question was particularly about uh, potential mismatch between singers, soloists, and orchestras. Well, you used the word um, limiting the voice for yeah. certain bits of early repertory, which is intriguing. Um, it, you know, it's often said of people being brought up in collegiate choirs that if only we could get them, singing teacher say this, if only we could get them out of the choir, we could do something with them. And you seem to be touching on the same thing that eventually you need to you, you you need to harness what you can develop humanly with your instrument and be free to do that, but always listening, always gauging how you might not sort of diminish what you do, but how you might just modulate it according to the circumstances. So I'm sure you one is flexible, but at the same time there's this worry that some people have about the degree to which you might need to close things down in order to conform to a sound world. An easy example would be if, if my voice is so big and un not focused that in a recit people don't understand the words anymore, then I use my voice in a wrong way because I kind of... the, 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 the rules of the composition need to be respected. And the consensus in the uh, Baroque time was prima le parole, first the words, and then it was movere e docere, to teach and to move. So 
if 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 I lose the words and if I lose the rhetoric aspect, if a singer oversings commas constantly because they have this bel canto voice and large phrasing on a baroque aria, then of course they ruin the piece. That that, that, that an, I've heard it and I, and I, and I don't like it. But I've also experienced young singers being afraid of creating a, a bigger sound because it did not fall into what they knew from recordings. Like, like in, in master classes, I hear so many more or less good imitations of Emma Kirkby. But Emma, is the or she's the original, but there's so many sopranos who just try to imitate her sound. And it's, uh, it, it comes back to being an informed singer, I need to study the rules of the music I sing. I need to know the background. I need to know which Sunday is this from. Which gospel does this cantata talk about? What is the context? If I stand up in front of an audience, what is my task? Am I preacher? Is it say, die Welt, das Sündenhaus bricht nur, then I'm preaching. But if I say, Oh God, if I talk, if it's a prayer, of course I don't approach the audience. So there needs to be a, 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 a constant awareness of where am I directing my energy to, my voice to, what is my, my task in this moment? Am I preacher? Am I storyteller? In a cantata I can be shepherd and nymph and everything needs to be precisely readable, understandable by the audience. Um, well, <coughs> you, you, in the, I think your students are going to have a, a, a wonderful time in the, the next few days, so that, that's great. But recent, in the, the last part of what you were saying, you ran through a minefield and, and you've survived miraculously, but I haven't had, there won't be time for me to detonate anything. <laughs> so, um, but I do, I do worry about one thing, there's a whole assumption, whatever your views on the authenticity or period instruments or early music revival, that the countertenor was the... Uh, emblematic voice, if you like, of, of, of the early music movement. Well, maybe it was, but was it the emblematic voice of the period we're talking about? I know of no evidence that falsetto singing as a solo voice certainly existed at all in the mid Middle Ages. It was only sporadically there and as a substitute for voice, often in the late 16th century, early 17th century, only in Italy or perhaps Germany as well. Purcell's music, 90% is of the counter service is not for a falsetto voice. Bach, we don't know, but I don't doubt that anybody could name any countertenor from Bach's Germany at that time. Uh, if there was full setting, it was a singing, it was probably a soprano. But Handel never once used a full setist on stage in, in any of his operas in Italy or in mm -hmm. England. And actually, the answer to the first question is possibly partly in the fact that castrati and women, which were used interchangeably for those alto and soprano parts, were singing in their speaking voice. So that handicap that you've described mm -hmm. about the full set of voice, so certainly as a sort of voice concerned with, with, with uh, projecting words in the ways that you've described very well, beautifully, um, that, that is a handicap. And that is why there's no evidence whatsoever that Dowland, for example, Dowland songs uh, were sung by full setters. But the whole assumption of the public that you sing to assumes that. Does that concern you? Uh, is that... Is that... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the thing is, I, I, for example, with Bach, we know that's at least what Tom Koopman told me, that there's one letter of Bach complaining that his personal assistant had... Um, it's not right. It's not right. Yeah. Okay, so I stop this. Okay. Yeah. The, 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 the thing is, then I should add a disclaimer in the... Yeah. In the, the thing is... Yeah, but look, I don't if, you. It's, it's, it's the, if Dietrich Fischer-Diskau sings, sings the Winterreise, sings the Winterreise no does, he no need to, does, does he need to write, I'm not the original singer that Schubert wrote it for? No, because I, everyone will know. I'm, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just trying to say something here. The countertenor voice exists these days. It's a voice that expresses itself Absolutely. like any other human being can sing, countertenors sing. Of course. More or less good. It's a vocal range that is defined as the alto range countertenor. These days, the repertoire, what I sing is what Bach names alto, what is marked in Handel oratorios as alto. If I have a Dowland song that is too high or too low, I transpose it. Tony Rulli told me in Basel, he said, don't flip over a page in a, in a songbook by Dowland and say, oh, this is too high, this is too low. Transpose the piece. If you want to sing it, 
and then you offer something to the audience and then people can decide, do they want to buy a ticket? Do they want to hear this singer with this weird, strange voice that is not authentic, that is not historic? Do they want to hear this or not? This is, this is what, what, what I do. And I never claimed, I'm not a castrato and I sing Handel operas. And why do we pick countertenors to replace Castrati. Because I always said like I that. prefer I prefer a good contralto in a handle opera to a bad countertenor. <laughs> Me too. But the concept of what the castrato voice stood for in the Baroque time translates perfectly to what the countertenor voice stands for today in society. It's a good for, substitute. It's a, yeah, but it's it's, it's a substitute. Yeah. It's a man that yeah, sings yeah. high. And this man sings I'm something. not complaining about that. I, I'm, what are, I'm, my point succinctly. What's the question, is, please? The question <laughs> is quite simple. Does it concern you that the public as a whole assumed that the falsetto of countertenor voice as we now know it was predominant in periods earlier uh, from, let's say, 1715 beforehand? I still enjoy singing without being bothered by this. Oh, yeah, I thought so. Sorry? What do you know what the public thinks? I'm not talking about what the public thinks. I mean, what the public knows. Yeah. I just want to make the same point as that we made. Come to the Castrato much closer than Contralto or Dimitri Soprano and to Countertown. Yes. The castrato voice was closer to a mezzo, mezzo, soprano. mezzo soprano. We have uh, alto castrati, mezzo soprano castrati, soprano castrati. The term castrato is not specifically meant for one vocal range. And we know that Handel didn't compose for alto soprano or some kind of generic term for a voice, but he composed for Mr. Senesino. Francesco Bernardi from Siena, and he knew his voice, and he Taylor made a composition for this specific singer, exploiting the strength of the singer and not exposing the weaknesses too much, which is the big difference to Bach, who ba Bach doesn't care about the singer. <laughs> Bach says, you better be good enough to sing this, and you speak the words, you sing with your heart, you com communicate the message, you are aware of the context of what this is about, and then you collect points with me, and I have students, <laughs> I have students that maybe don't have the most beautiful voice, and maybe it's not an authentic voice, and maybe it's a countertenor singing what with Bach has not been sung by countertenor, but by a boy soprano, a boy alto, but on the other level, other than technical performance or something, or the beauty of voice, in this singing lesson, the student delivers, <laughs> preaches the, the words, sings it properly, and in the end I say, yes, with your capacity, what you can do today, with the voice you have today, you collected 100 points with Mr. Bach. What you can do in 10 years or 20 years, or whether if I compare this now to the recording of this famous singer, I would still prefer the famous singer. That's written on a different piece of paper. It's within your capacity you achieved 100 points with Mr. Bach. Well, I told you at the beginning that I had a list of questions. I haven't asked any of them. <laughs> um, one. I was going to ask, the first I was going to ask was what Beyond Bach meant, the title of this week's events. And I think I'm not going to ask that question because I think we've, we've seen already in the last hour and a quarter part of what Beyond Bach means and I think we're going to see more over the coming days. So I think at this point we will thank Andreas Scholl very much for his generosity in sharing his thoughts with us this evening and we look forward to his generosity over the coming days. Thank you.